Good day and welcome to Bardcast 14. Two weeks ago, the Bardcast 13 show was entirely devoted to a disconcerting kind of split screen coverage. On the one hand, I was excited to reveal entirely new discoveries, codes of extraordinary significance proving conclusively that the Rosicrucian grandmasters we've been learning about, John Dee, Francis Bacon, Edward de Vere, who were at the core of the Shakespeare puzzle, had gone to enormous lengths to document for future generations the truth behind Solomon's Temple and the centuries-old mystery of the Ark's disappearance. On the other hand, I was simultaneously learning shocking news coming out of Ethiopia after a three months long media blackout of a massacre in the small town of Axum where the Ark of the Covenant is believed by some to have resided for several centuries in the Church of St. Mary of Zion. It was a mind-boggling confluence of two types of groundbreaking news. One, Shakespeare writers evidently wanted us to know possibly the whereabouts of the Ark, or at least they wanted us to start a conversation about its meaning and the mystery behind its disappearance. And yet, two, at the same time, this heartbreaking news of hundreds of civilians protecting the Ark being mowed down in a hail of gunfire. News coming out of the area was sporadic and confusing, but I felt that lines of communication to and from the outside world were opening up and I expected we'd be getting far more clarity on the fate of these people and of the sacred artifacts they might have been in possession of. Sadly, in the intervening two weeks, news has again slowed to a trickle and the greater portions of the so-called developed world are still largely ignoring the pleas of the poor and suppressed. This is uh, from Human Rights Watch. It's over a, a week old. They say uh, on November 19th, Ethiopian and Eritrean forces indiscriminately shelled Axum killing and wounding civilians. For a week after taking control of the town, the forces shot civilians and pillaged and destroyed property, including healthcare facilities. After Tigray militia and Axum residents attacked Eritrean forces on November 28th, the Eritrean forces in apparent retaliation fatally shot and summarily executed several hundred residents, mostly men and boys, over a 24-hour period. Eritrean troops 
committed heinous killings in Axum with wanton disregard for civilian lives, said Letitia Bader, Horn of Africa director at Human Rights Watch. Ethiopian and Eritrean officials can no longer hide behind a curtain of denial, but should allow space for justice and redress, not add to the layers of trauma that survivors already face. It seems the area is still under a, a partial media blackout, as major reports like that one are still few and far between. In the US, we're apparently more interested in how hard Harry and Meghan have had it. Meanwhile, I again had to take an unexpected week off to research more leads supplied by broadcast followers. As you know, it was one of you who, who got me into the, the King James Bible ciphers in the first place, back in early November of 2020, when Phil Rick Ricketts wrote to me. He said, uh, the bard code, I'm looking forward to the show, I presume. And he sent this link, uh, immediately searched for this image, he said, and seeing your video, I'm resisting impulses to start puzzling myself. Well, the link he sent me was this, the cover of the King James Bible, 1611. And as you know, I showed you part of that uh, in the last podcast. But just as I thought I had delved as deeply as I could into these King James revelations, somebody who goes by the handle of boats and history sent this to me. Great work, sad story in Axum. I wonder if you're familiar with God Code by Timothy Smith talks about a code found in the original English language Bible, which describes items hidden under the old temple once in the city of David. Actually, he's wrong about English language Bible. He, uh, Timothy is researching the original Hebrew text from the Leningrad Codex and the Aleppo Codex, the oldest ones. So he had sent that and I, you know, well, I asked for your help, so I said I'd take, I'd take a look, but I didn't expect it to reveal much because there have been so many of these so-called God codes and Bible codes. So this is, this is Timothy's book. Um, but I did look into it, and I honestly found Timothy Smith's work riveting. Um, but again, as I say, there's, there's just been such a glut of these. I mean, these are just a few. There's the God Code by Greg Braden. There's the God Code, A Hidden Secret by Jordi Diaz. There's the God Code, We Are Robots by Steve Rhodes. There's the God Code, Human Hubris Unleashed by Don Allen Holbrook. There's the God Code by Bishop T.D. Jakes. And there's the God Code... Um, that's an online Twitter account. There's the God code of the digital universe. There's the God code for business. There's God code of life. There's God's chaos code. There's then there's all the Bible codes. Bible code came out. I don't recall when. New York Times bestseller. Then there was Bible code two, the countdown, and Bible code three, saving the world. The mysterious Bible codes, secrets of the Bible code revealed. The Bible Code, Finding Jesus, the Bible Code, Judgment Day, the real Bible Code, Beyond the Bible Code, the truth behind the Bible Code, the Bible Code exposing the hidden truth, the keys to the Bible's encoded messages, Bible Codes Plus, Bible Code Bombshell. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just exhausting, and I, I think Timothy has suffered a bit of a backlash from this because you can only take a certain amount of it without beginning to think, oh, come on, you know, so who's right and who's wrong and who's accurate and who's not? And, oh, another Bible code? Who wrote the Bible code? By Randall Ingemanson, who wrote, who wrote the Bible code? <laughs> I don't know what that means. There's a whole series of Bible code statistics. How, how accurate are these codes? So D. Patrick... 
pick a day because <laughs> done this whole series. Number one, Bible code statistics. Alien mystery revealed. Oh, Netanyahu and Iran in number three, and President Trump and Russia in number four, and congratulations, Trump, second term. Whoops, that's not so accurate, is it? And Joe Biden and Rudy and legal and all these, Hunter Biden, Fox News, found in the Bible, apparently, 2020 election, and Melania spelt wrong, and on and on it goes. <laughs> And, you know, in order to sell, hey, one chance in 21 million is what they start out with. But by the time book eight has come out, that you know, inflation, one chance in 463 trillion. Trying to convince us that these are, this is accurate. We get lost in this, this ludicrous list of, oh, here's my favorite, coronavirus in the Bible code. <laughs> and the prescription for how to... Um, cure it yeah great surprisingly this wasn't predicted in the bible code and we don't find this guy either and you'd think that would be there because those are kind of events of biblical proportions aren't they but timothy's work i i found it riveting and so as promised i'm going to first catch you up on what i couldn't show you in podcast 13 simply because there was too much and I'm trying to keep these master classes down to a more manageable time of between an hour and maybe 90 minutes. And then I'm going to show you the truly astounding connections that became apparent to me as I delved into Tim's own work with the original Hebrew text. So just to catch you up, starting with this, that's what I showed in the last show cover of the Holy Bible. Essentially, it's dealing with the Old Testament at first, this section. I counted the number of characters, which is the, what I always have to do. Found that there were 312 characters. That is precisely half of the Enochian tables that were given to John Dee by angels in 1584. Here's the whole of the Enochian tables and that's a key part of, of, of all this uh, subterfuge and what is being hidden so I knew that we were onto something here I would put those those 312 characters into this particular grid here it is and right in the middle as always is the most important place that Shakespeare is going to alert us to it says Micah and Micah is an Old Testament prophet who predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. And remember, it was 312 characters. So Micah 312 is exactly the biblical reference where he talks about, therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. I knew, therefore, that these codes were going to be about the destruction of the temple. Solomon's temple and possibly further. And as you saw last time, it goes deeper into the building of the second temple and its destruction at the hands of the Romans. Um, so just to show you how that ended, here's the four crosses that are utterly perfectly interlocked. One at the bottom, the rose cross with the arc crossing across it. The green one in the middle is the Via Cross, which represents the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One at the top is the tree of life that's connected to a triple tau. And the one that's connecting all of them together is the word covenant. Ark of the covenant is within that code. And it's all then crossed over by another cross, perfectly balanced in the middle, that says hidden in a church. And so that's where we left it. I had shown you that last time and said then that I had to move on to the next section. And obviously, we've got that engraving is the Old Testament. There's another engraving once you are four-fifths of the way through the entire Bible that is announcing the New Testament. Well... I've come to learn that all of John Dee's encodings for Shakespeare are not only telling about 
bringing all of the various warring factions together. We had the Catholics against the Protestants. It was a very, very tense time. You know, we're Catholics, no, we're Protestants, no, we're Catholics again, no, we're Protestants again. Under Elizabeth, people were being burned at the stake for being one or the other. And of course, John Dee was communing with angels in the hopes of being a bridge to the divine that might help bring about peace. Many of his codes are in Hebrew, many are Islamic, many of them are deep Latin and Catholic, many are in a more modern Protestant English. All of this is going on and so I got the intuition that obviously I must go to the New Testament, there's probably a code there as well. And indeed it is. So let me show you. This is where we were last time. I showed you that the number of characters here gives it away. I mean, it's 264 and 264 is the very page number of the first folio of all of Shakespeare's plays that is a wrong. It, well, it's leading you to a wrong number. The next page number is 273, but it's telling you that. It's saying, no man must know, no man must know. What follows the numbers altered? No man must know. And then MOAI gets turned around to IAOM because he tells us to revolve it. And in other words, that is telling us the entire secret to how to solve all the codes that have been laid out for us as instructions to find out what's really going on with this Shakespeare subterfuge. So 264 is the number of characters and I know this is going to be very, very significant. So I'm going to put it into the same grid, 12 across, as was the Old Testament. But instead of having Micah in the middle, now there's going to be four lines less and the grid itself looks like this and it's got a different centerpiece. Still has though at its middle point the De Vere. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is what you saw last time. So go back to it if you didn't see it. That it, 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 it's it absolutely a stunning collection of usually crosses that are telling the story about King Menelik, who was the son of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And Solomon gave to Menelik, supposedly, this is a this is a mythological story, but maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but here it is in the in in the King James engraving ciphers showing us we need to pay attention to this. And why is that important? Because well Menelik is was the king of Ethiopia. And there has been a lot of work done on the idea that the Ark was taken from Solomon's temple, possibly around about 660 BC, during the reign of the very evil Pharaoh Manasseh, and taken down the Nile, and possibly put it on Elephantine Island, and eventually makes its way down to Ethiopia. And all the clues here are about aspects of the ark, such as the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the gold lid with the cherubims on top. There are two, though, listed in the codes, two seats of mercy. There are also two caporet. Caporet is the Hebrew word for the seat of mercy. There are two sets of ten commandments, the broken ones and the non-broken ones. There's two sets of tables of stone, one called the stones of the testimony and one called stones that has the word Moses running through it. One, There's one I am, the main name of God, I am, and one running at right angles to it saying, am I? You know, so it's this conglomeration of everything encoded so strategically and perfectly into something that's quite stunning. And it's only half of the, the New Testament codes, because I said I was going to wait and show you the other half this week.
Well, there's one final word that slides into place there that connects to the word arc and to one of the codes that says caporet, meaning the mercy seat. And that word is tabot. And that's an Ethiopian word for, it is a standing for, it can be the ark, it can be the mercy seat, it can be the contents of the ark, the stone tablets of the commandments, but it also means replica. So instead of answering many questions, it kind of opens up more questions than you'd think. I mean, is, is it meaning that's just a replica or is it the real thing? And then all this news hits of the terrible atrocities happening right there in that church where that either real ark or replica has been held. So this is the top part that I did not get to show you last podcast 13. So we need to go to here. What you just saw there is the dome of the rock on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And this dome is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, seen from a different angle now. This is from the southeast, so the actual, the golden dome is to the right here, to the north. Now we're going to look across we're looking from the east, from the Mount of Olives, all the way north to all these stones that are surrounding the Temple Mount. And here we are at the south and then going further south down into an area that is the city of David, where many writers, many philosophers, many archaeologists, many people who have been studying this for a long time are suggesting this is where the real Solomon's temple was, not here. And of course that would change the whole political situation there because this is owned by the Muslims now and the, the Jews are not allowed to pray in that area at all, they can only pray on the left side of this picture here, which is known as the Western Wall. And of course, they've been praying there for centuries. Well, this entire area that is today called the Temple Mount and is surrounded by these walls of stone that have been judged to be Herodian, built by Herod, this is a big, big problem in the Middle East, isn't it? It's the problem. This is the most contested piece of real estate on the planet, probably. Now, as I say, many people who have been studying this a lot longer than I have are of the opinion that this is the true layout, that Solomon's Temple is there down where you see it superimposed on this artist rendering. This is the Western Wall, but it's the Western Wall of the Roman garrison, a fort that was overlooking Solomon's Temple and then the Second Temple, known later as Herod's Temple. And this is the positioning of where those buildings would be in the old setup. And if this is the case, well, I think we all understand this is considerably different from what is the current belief because the Jews believe they've got to take back the Temple Mount in order to build their third temple. And they believe that that must happen before the Messiah can return. And we don't want World War Three over it, and yet it certainly has been a tinderbox of, of, of just incalculable... Uh, loss and pain and anguish and fights and wars for, for so long. So if their temple grounds are really where archaeologists, some archaeologists currently think, according to this picture, there's no problem at all. So the temple could be built there. That's Jewish own land. 
So this is the setup that we are being taught about in these King James ciphers. Now, many people have done a lot of work on this. This is Robert Cornuk. I highly recommend his books on the subject and a couple of documentaries are online. You can find them. Graham Hancock has done a tremendous amount of work on this same thing and is of the same general belief, certainly about the Ark being in Ethiopia and about this being Fort Antonia, the Roman garrison, not the actual remaining walls of Herod's temple. And then my friend Peter Dawkins has also done a tremendous amount of work on all of this, and he too is of the, this general opinion. They might disagree slightly on the precise position of where the temples were, um, but I think overall they all agree that this area that I've marked in red is Fort Antonia. So now, what does this mean about what we're being shown in these ciphers on the engravings of the King James Bible? I'm going to take you through now the part that I did not show you last show. Right in the middle here, we have the Devir. And we all know that that's the Hebrew word for the Holy of Holies, wherein was kept the Ark of the Covenant in Solomon's Temple. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with these, the way these grids work, I've done so many of them and identified John Dee's fingerprints in, in all of them. So to, um, to try to describe a general rule to you, I would say this. I've always noticed and experienced that he seems to operate by these rules of anagramming that are, you must be able to move your pen or pencil over the letters, either horizontally or vertically, and connect a group of letters. And if they connect in that way and they form something pertinent to the message, then that's probably what was intended. One of the rules that he certainly observes is you can't just jump from one letter diagonally to another. It's just always a matter of connecting vertically or horizontally. It's kind of a, a Sudoku game, really, in it with, with text rather than numbers. And I see here letters that form the word Nights. And I, I know where this is going, and we all know where this is going, because of course, it's the Templars. The Templars are attached to this whole place. This is where the Templars set up their, their main um, establishment of, of, that's where they were, at what they called Salomone's uh, Templum. So, the Knights Templar, well, there's the word Templars, but I seem to be breaking that rule because there's a connection here that needs to be made. Is that part of Knights Templars, the word D? Well, yes, it actually is, because here's how they named their own establishment, their Templo di Salomone. So they are the Templars, di Salomone. And so we're going to look for the word Salomone, or Solomon, and here it is. And again, have I broken that rule? There's a space between the letters. I want to show you that I don't need to put them there. That A and L and E can go actually down here, and in that case, the rule is being observed. You can just move your pencil along through those letters, through Templars, into Salomone, and you still have the same word, and you haven't had to jump. But in this case, they are making a point, or John Dee is making a point of saying that the, the Templars, the Salomone, and something else. And so it is part of a construction of a sentence. And what? Well, we will see here a perfect tau cross with the word 
fourth T. And any of you who know that uh, the, the various presentations I've given that all point to the fourth T, you will understand that that's hugely significant in, in the Shakespeare subterfuge. There is, however, an N there. Why is that there? Again, you'd have to have seen other presentations to know that D uses an N and a T connected to each other, actually ligatured together in Shakespeare's monument in Stratford, where they look like one character, but they are ligatured. But when you separate them into Roman numerals, N becomes a, an I and a V. And they use Roman numerals often. And so the I and the V is what? It's Roman numerals for four. And so four T becomes fourth T. So this is a way that he, he, he uses this many, many times to indicate fourth T. If you'll remember the, the, the very first code in the Sonnet's dedication says these Sonnets or by Evia the fourth T. Anyway, that's on other presentations that you can look for online. How do I really know this is John Dee's work? There are two dots here above that fourth T. Whenever there's a colon that is separated from the word, as this one is here, Greek, then a space, then a colon, then a space, it is his way of saying those two dots in that colon work as two separate characters. He uses them as what are called nulls in cryptography to, to shift the grid further along into place so as to make the connections vertically work properly. If there's no space there, if it's just a colon in a normal placement immediately after a word, then it is to be treated as one character. But in this case, as you can see, there's a space, and so it's treated as two. Someone asked me about this, actually, in one of the comments, and I answered it at length because I, it is an important point. Is it random? Is, am I just choosing to say that? Um, well, one of the things that helps you know that it is, is part of his methodology is the fact that it would not make a perfect grid if it, indeed it was just one character. It wouldn't make the three the, the, the 264 in this case that's needed. Uh, if it was only one character, you would have had to have added another character somewhere. So there are various ways that you can confirm this. But for myself, having seen literally, gosh, a hundred or more of these codes, uh, he always uses this system. So those two dots are part of his system and they are also part of his name. And here's D. And here's D again, backwards. And of course, it's in the shape of a seven. And many of you might remember that in the gravestone, he has O-O-D in the shape of a seven because his code number was 007. And so again, here you see it. And I could show you again, at least half a dozen codes where he uses this. Well, way more than half a dozen actually, but half a dozen where the actual shape of the seven is perfect. In this case here, his I, and I was a double for J in those times, so that's John D. And here's, going vertically up, here's his name again, D with dot dot. And again, he uses sometimes OOD and sometimes dot dot D, because a dot is really a, a cipher, it is nothing, and an O is nothing or it is zero mathematically. And so the same thing is in the shape of a seven, except it has this E-L and L is the Hebrew name of God, one of the Hebrew names of God that he likes to attach to his codes and his own name sometimes. But in this case, I really feel as though using the L and the I, he's literally telling us something is a lie. What would be the lie here is this, that this is attached to. Because if this is, yes, it, you, you're led to it by seeing, oh, fourth T. But it's actually, as well as that, it is Fort Antonio. 
And you could say, oh, well, you've taken the O of 4 to make it the O of Antonia. And again, I don't need to do that. We could put the I and the O here and take them out from there. And that would still work. It'd still be honoring the rules. But in this case, he's compacting so much into such a small space that you'll see it makes perfect sense that this is indeed intended to be the Fort Antonia because there's another hidden meaning embedded in it in, by adding the letters down below of that H and the D of the De Vere. Now, that gives us Fantoniad. Well, in the play Antony and Cleopatra, the name Mark Antony is spelled correctly, I believe, it's about 176 times. It's always spelt correctly. But there's this weird word thrown into this one scene, Vantoniat. There's no explanation for it except in context. It's saying it's the name of the lead ship, the Egyptian admiral. Well, this is a, is a speech by Inabarbus. He comes in and he's one of Mark Antony's generals. And he's watching a battle go on between Mark Antony and the Caesar that he's fighting by sea. Mark Antony is always spelled A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. But you who know the deep meaning of T-H, it's that nudge, nudge, wink, wink, Rosicrucian's Freemasonic symbol, isn't it? The T-H of three T's hooked together, ligatured, to look like a T-H, but they mean triple tau. That's the name of God. I am that I am. So in the most clever way possible, if he's taking that TH, the sacred meaning of the TH, out of Anton, Antony and putting it at the beginning and making this adjustment, saying the Antonia, remember the fortress was called Fort Antonia. Look what it's indicating actually visually as well as poetically. The purple is the Antonia, the red is the TH, the sacred part. The sacred was the, the holy Solomon's temple and then Herod's temple, the second temple. He's taken the TH out of Antony and made this name up with a D on the end to, to honor D, because D signed his name just D. But it's at a point in the play when Antony makes the absolute military catas catastrophic mistake of his life. And this is historically accurate. He's fighting against Caesar who's coming to make war on him because Antony is now is with Cleopatra. Cleopatra has given him her 60 ships, and this is what this says. The Egyptian admiral, with all their 60, fly and turn the rudder. What has happened in this scene is Mark Antony has said, uh, I'm going to fight Caesar by sea. And his generals are all warning him, oh, no, 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 you mustn't do that. In fact, I think I've got the actual text here to show you. Um, yeah. He says in the play, I'm going to fight by ship. Here's Enobarba saying, your ships are not well manned. Your, ma they're, your mariners and militants and reapers, people, they're, they're, not, they're not good warriors. Antony absolutely categorically says, no, by sea, by sea, because he's in love with Cleopatra and Cleopatra's given him all her ships. And he's smitten and his judgment is off and they still try to tell him you can't no 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 the, the whole sentence the whole paragraph there is saying you won't you won't win that way you're a great foot soldier you're great on land wait for caesar to come on land no he says i'll fight at sea and this of course is the the turning point and he loses drastically a major major battle it's the turning point and he ends up being so shamed that he commits suicide well here it says ship underneath that the Antoniad the word ship and by sea by sea the very thing he exclaims in the play no by sea by sea that is his absolute downfall so 
D has linked all this together <laughs> into a, a cluster of letters that is just astoundingly telling you that this is all tied to Mar the Mark Antony scene. Now, why? Herod so adored Mark Antony that he named Fort Antonia after Mark Antony. This is the historical truth. So that, that Roman garrison that overlooked Solomon's temple and then Herod's temple was named Fort Antonia after Mark Antony. So here you have Shakespeare actually commenting on it in the play and giving you this clue about the Antonia and now D putting it into a, a coded grid that literally is telling you this is a lie. This f is Fort Antonia, not the Templum of Solomon as it is believed to be today and was then 400 years ago during the Renaissance. Back then it, was, it has been believed to be the place of the original temple and they're saying no it's not, it's Fort Antonia. Now there is so much more embedded in this that it is almost inconceivable that one could en encapsulate so tightly the various meanings into all of this. You see, what is going on there historically is there's, there's a moment in the Bible where Christ is on the Mount of Olives and he's looking across to the temple. So where I showed you that, that vantage point at the beginning where you saw the Golden Dome, we're looking from the Mount of Olives in the east, looking to the west towards the fortress and, and Solomon's temple, Herod's temple. And Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing, he says, there will not be one stone left on top of another. Mark my words, in a generation, this will all be gone. Now, and he's, he's pointing to the temple. Somebody asked him about the temple. And he says, not one stone will be left on another. And of course, a couple of months later, he is crucified. AD 32, and in AD 70, one generation later, that's exactly what happened. The Romans utterly massacred everyone in the city of David, in Solomon's temple, in Herod's temple. <sighs> and so brutal was this, this fight that they just killed indiscriminately ev everyone. Oh, there were a lot of losses on both sides, but it was men, women, children, everyone just absolutely massacred and not content with that. They went down into the actual foundation stones of the temple. They not, not only did they burn the temple and knock it all down, but they went deep down and took every stone out and threw, cast them aside and threw everything out so that when uh, Josephus writes historically about it later, he says you would not know there had been a city there. Everything was gone, not a stone left. Now, Jesus' words, according to Josephus' account, are totally accurate if he's talking about the temple and about the city of David. But on the other hand, what are all these stones being left? There are 10,000 Herodian stones left there around the Temple Mount. So did Jesus get it wrong? Or were those the stones of the fort? Obviously the Romans are not going to destroy their own fort, right? They, that's, it housed 6,000 and 4,000 associates that were there to help them. So 10,000 people lived there. Josephus describes it as, as, as the size of several cities. But we look at it today and it is believed to be, oh, that's, that's the remnants of Herod's temple. So it cannot be if indeed it is true that not one stone was left upon another. Jesus is referring to the stones of the temple, not to the stones of the aggressors who will eventually destroy Jerusalem. So this is an enormously important aspect of this whole code. Why would they want to be telling us this in this grid? That here you have 
the Mount of, well, I think we know where that's going, the Mount of Olives. And again, are we cheating? There's another and there because the story goes deeper. The Mount of Olives and. What happened on the Mount of Olives? Well, first of all, Jesus tells this story that I've just told you, but he also does something extraordinary with the fig tree. And this is the parable of the fig tree where he compares the fig tree to a garden. Uh, it's in a garden. The vineyard is really the earth. The vineyard owner is God. The gardener of the vineyard is Jesus himself. And he's saying, essentially, I'm paraphrasing again, that he, that you must take care of that fig tree. And if it is has been it has been um, not well cared for and not properly tended for three years and it is dying and that's a reference to him and john the baptist preaching the gospel of repentance that the jews must repent of their their they have turned away from the mosaic commandments and that's why they're going to suffer the consequences karmically coming down on them and he's warning that this will come but he uses the fig tree as a metaphor within that whole story. And at the same time, he's connected here, D has the fig tree with an upside down cross that says the rose cross, the rose tau, to let you know who's doing this. These are, the, this is the Rosicrucians. And what's the very, very uh, cross beam that crosses <laughs> the rose tau? The word Christ that connects to Mount of Olives and fig tree and the Rosicrucians are telling the story. And why? Because this is literally where the Rosicrucian emblem comes from, the rose cross. The heart uh, expressed as a rose in the center of the cross on which Christ was crucified. That's where Rosicrucian comes from. It's absolutely as clear as can be. So all that has been ciphered into the top part and then the bottom part is what I showed you before. It's the most staggering piece of work and right in the center of it is of course the Tabot connects to the Ark as telling you, well, look at Ethiopia and look at <laughs> Everything that we're telling you about the possibility that there maybe are two caparets and two seats of mercy and two tables and two sets of commandments and two stone, and well, I've just named it already, two stone tablets, one being stones of testimony, one being stones of Moses, the ones that he broke with Menelik there, the Ethiopian king who was given the Ark of the Covenant. What is this saying? Now, I think it's quite possible that one can argue with this a little bit and say, oh, Alan, you've really jammed it so full of things. It can't possibly mean, be meaning all of that. And there is a couple of things that I could say, well, OK, look, maybe. Oh, right. Maybe we can take out the fig tree. Maybe we can take out the Mount of Olives. I don't see it because honestly, it is so integral to the story. And and yet. What I would say to those naysayers who want to say that, you know, um, there's just too much here, it's beyond comprehension that anyone could work out something like this, then go back and have a look at my presentation on the actual gravestone, Shakespeare's gravestone, that again is completely done by John Dee, his fingerprints and his name and his 007 signature is all over it. And he did exactly the same thing there every interlocking line vertically and horizontally is significant. He was a master at this. And if one or two of the little things that are there that you don't like and you think, oh, that's a stretch, okay, I don't mind if you want to, to argue that what is clear is the absolute crystal clear center of like the Old Testament is those four crosses and the fifth cross saying hidden in a church 
There's much more in that that I haven't shown you. In this case, I have shown you pretty much everything that is in here in the New Testament part. And we could simplify it down to the basics of Menelik and Caporet and the Ark and the Messiah and the Devere in the center and Dee's signature and the Knights Templar and Solomon's Temple and Fort Antonia and cut out the rest. But you can't get past the fact that all of those basics are there and if they are there and they are intentional it's probably it's hardly hardly matters whether the rest was intended or not because think of it a person that can think this way and can work this don't forget it has to be done backwards you've got to set out what you want to convey in 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 what's called the plain text and then write cipher text around it so that it seems to be saying something else in other words it seems to be just the engraving of the new testament saying oh this was printed in london by robert barker and you know you've got to work it backwards and the amount of work that this takes is beyond it's just not even reasonable to think that the mind that can wrap itself around that would not see all these other connections as they were they were being manifest and if they saw them they would choose to either leave them in or if they didn't want them in they could knock them out and change the wording couldn't they and so to me it's very very convincing that this is this is all intentional because i've seen john do it john d do it time and time again I want to now just take you to the last part of this, which is why I took another week off to delve into the work that someone alerted me to. I, I, I only know their name as the, the handle that they have online, Boats and, Boats and something. I've forgotten the last part of it. You know, they said, look at Timothy Smith's work with the God code. And as I say, I was, well, I, I was really deeply impressed by it. It, it was uh, something that I thought, well, there are so many of these, right? There are so many Bible codes and God codes, and uh, it's not worth my time to be looking at this. And yet, as soon as I went into it, I saw that this man who'd written this is so sincere and was so accurate in everything, in all his study and all his research, and was in fact very, very resistant to even putting it out because he knew that it would be possibly bring a lot of attack on him simply because of, the, of you know, most of those Bible codes have been severely debunked and some of them for good reason, as I showed you just kind of just let's make a buck let's sell a bunch of books let's make up some codes this is not that you see this is not even in the text of the bible is it that's why i call it the king james ciphers it's not in the text of the bible it's in the engravings this is a totally different animal this is utterly un heard of unseen except in the world of Shakespeare where these these incredible gridded codes have been put into the cover of the sonnets for instance that that shows the geographic coordinates of the great pyramid and mathematical constants these people are doing deep 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 work trying to show us a truth about their mathematical knowledge, about their ancient wisdom, about their connections to ancient monuments all over this planet. Why? If you don't get anything from this talk but this, please, I want you to understand this is not another bible code it is not another god code it's not another oh the real truth behind the no this is absolutely a, a, a completely different phenomenon and it is telling us something over and over and over again that they obviously felt so powerfully had to be conveyed to us about the temples 
and about the Ark of the Covenant. And why we're getting all this information right now, I don't know, and why it is you know, synchronous with this awful news that the, the very moment that these 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 revelations were coming through and I was getting it and going, oh my God, look at that, look at that, look at that Ark of the Covenant, beautiful. Let's start a conversation about it. And at the same time, all of a sudden, it was as though it was just gone. You're being led to, it's here, possibly in Ethiopia. I think there are other possible places because clearly this is saying there's more than one. So why? So we must delve into why, and so one can go even deeper. And I'm just going to leave you with this a very, very quick summer, summation. If the point is to tell you we're trying to unify the various religions, we're trying to bring peace to these warring factions of the Catholics and the Protestants, and the, the Jews and the Muslims, and the, all this terrible strife, that is brought about by one side saying, my God's better than your God, then obviously these beings, these great beings, who I am naming specifically as John D., Francis Bacon, and Edward de Vere, had a very, very sacred message to convey. And they would go the extra mile and they would create something incomparable. It would be the magnum opus of their life's work. And in recognizing that, I just had the intuition once I saw Timothy Smith's work that these must come together, the Old Testament and the New. And so I did something that you're, <laughs> if, you're not, <laughs> if you're not blown away now, watch this. We've seen that this is the Old Testament, the very basic message. There's a lot more there, but I've kept it fairly simple. Here's the New Testament. Uh, I haven't kept this simple, <laughs> but it could be simpler. Uh, but this is covering so much. But the, And yet they're, they're, they're matching, aren't they? They're both talking about the Ark of the Covenant. They're both talking about the destruction of the two temples. And then if one was to say, put these together, what would that be? Well, you could do it this way and, and it, it really wouldn't change anything. It would just have the same code on top of the other code and that, that, that wouldn't work. You must be in, you must have to think, well, what's it going to add up to? It's 312 and 264. And when you add that together, it gives you a 24 by 24 grid. It's 24 squared. And so you stretch them into their requisite 24 lines. And now you've got an entirely different grid. Is it conceivable? Could there be... <laughs> It does get kind of silly. Could, could, could a human being do this? Think of this? Work that out and say, I'm going to now make it work so that when I connect them in a different way, uh, a very, very integral message is still going to be there. What's your final message? What are you trying to tell us? Well, again, we're going to look to the center because that's always Shakespeare's system. The most important thing is in the center. Polonius says in Hamlet, I will find where truth is hid, though it will hid indeed within the center. And so right here in the center is the most elegant, absolutely simple thing you could possibly say that would sum up the whole thing. I, period, et. For those of you who are not familiar with how I've gone into this in the past, et is the Hebrew particle that literally connects the first letter, Aleph, to the last letter, Tav, and it means I am the beginning and the end. I am the Aleph Tav, the Alpha Omega, Christ's words. That the divine is at the beginning of creation, at the end of creation, and everything else in the middle is this massive drama that we have, but I am the beginning and the end. And that's literally right there in the center. And then if you stretch it down, you realize, oh, he's actually put the word, the name of God in. I am the beginning and the end. And what is right under it? 
perfectly balanced and above it perfectly balanced is an under it to make to extend that into a a a, a longer cross is the te which is the et in the opposite direction because everything in rosicrucian hermetic philosophy is balanced mirror image to each other m o a i i a o m four two six six two four this fall into thy hand revolve the perfection of balance in the universe is apparent everywhere to every action there's an equal and opposite reaction electron proton male female light dark yes no up down the whole construction has to be perfectly balanced and here it is again so he's saying i am the et i am the te eh. i am the inverse of the et i'm the beginning and the end and the end of the beginning who is king and Savior Jesus Christ all right so this message is the right there in the center and that would not be a surprising message to find in the Bible itself that King James has commissioned to be written in this new era of of, of Christianity going from Catholicism to Protestantism and yet still honoring the judaic tradition and the mosaic laws and the, the the old testament it's all there all right but what's this the the letters that are absolute capital letters in the actual engraving itself are those that say anno dom short for anno domini 1611 the date of publication 1611 but there's a perfect cross underneath it, a perfect tau cross underneath it, extending up to here, and it says, Rossio Madonna. Now, if you're like me, you won't know what that is. I didn't know what it was. I only learned what it was from Timothy Smith's book, because there's a whole section in there where he is led to a code that is part of his entire structure and his structure is extremely mathematical and it is measured precisely by modern software and he's able to look for precise what we call equidistant letter skips which is exactly what John Dee is doing here in those days in the Renaissance they were called Cardano grills named after Cardano who invented the system of equidistant letter skips at least well he didn't invent it but he made his own variation of it and John Dee is using his own variation on that but literally using the same essential system within the Hebrew text the oldest Hebrew text Timothy Smith finds embedded the words Rossio Madonna and here it is in the in the last message that they want to convey to us by combining the old and the new testaments what is that so you can read about it in timothy smith's book but what it is is this there there is a story of an area of spain where a marian uh, visitation uh, vision occurred you know mary has appeared in various places all over the planet most famously lords but many many places and this is one of them where she appeared to a hunter in the woods but she was she stands aside from the other images of just the merciful mother of christ mary because she adopted a persona that is kind of terrifying and that is of the virgin of the apocalypse so when she appeared to this hunter she appeared as mother mary but she gave birth to a christ child that became a christ man in front of him she literally is screaming and suns are pouring out of her a, a halo around her head is how it's described which has certain symbols in it two of which are the ark of the covenant and the holy grail by the way and she gives birth and fights off a i think it's a seven-headed might be a ten-headed i need to get deeper into this uh dragon 
but is literally from Revelation, from the last book in the Bible, the, the Virgin of the Apocalypse. She's a very terrifying uh, divine mother image, kind of more like the, the, uh, the Hindu um, Kali. Anyway, she's a Catholic vision of Mary. She's known as the Rocio Madonna. And here in typical understated Catholic fashion is her... <laughs> Uh, her, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to put it that way, but what could you say? Oh, do you have enough gold there? Um, it's <laughs> that's a niche in the church where her effigy is placed, based on on the on the uh, eyewitness testimony of of the person who saw her, and every year now. One million people come to this tiny little town that is no town the rest of the year. It only exists for the sake of honoring this this festival of the Rocio Madonna. And they celebrate for four days at the end of Pentecost every year. And like I say, a million people. But Timothy Smith's work. So one of you led me onto this and said, you've got to check out his work. I did, and immediately it sent me down another rabbit hole, and I didn't expect to find it, I mean, but it's just there. I mean, it's just right there, right next to the central message in this, in these two grids when you put them together. Rocio Madonna, as perfectly carved out, if you like, as it could possibly could be. Now, what's her message? Well, her message is that she is the ark because the ark, the original ark, contains the word of God given to Moses by Yahweh and put into the ark for safekeeping and kept in the holy of holies, this vision of Mary is the actual physical human, superhuman representation of the ark. She contains the word of God in her womb. She literally embodies the word of God, and that's why the symbols of the Holy Grail and the Ark were in the stars around her head and on the garments that she was wearing, and honoring that they are still are today. <laughs> what? She's the Ark. I literally I'm throwing this open to us all to, to converse about it, Go, write to me about it, talk to me about it, converse amongst yourselves about it. What does this mean? And look, <laughs> she's only connected to the ark. <laughs> and completing that and balancing it perfectly to give a tau cross through the rest of it and going through the name of Christ is Tabot the Ethiopian name for the Ark and the contents of the Ark and the mercy seat and replica. <laughs> I know as much about this as you do now. I, do, I, I don't know what this means. <laughs> I'm asking us to engage in conversation about it. There's another cross going down here, right? with one other letter to the side, mercy seat. Going up from the word king is the word Torah. This is the five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament that contain the original writings of God. Now we tend to think the Ten Commandments is what God wrote onto those stones. But there's much more in other parts of the Bible that suggests, no, 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 he didn't just write that. He wrote the, the entire Torah and Moses was instructed to put it into the ark. I'm not well up enough on all this. I'm literally learning it as I go. This is two weeks old to me. So I need to do more research on that. But from what I have read so far, the, the idea from Timothy Smith's work is that ultimately the original Torah, is a most compact code 
with the perfection of the word of God in it and it is in the ark and he's looking for it. Timothy is looking for that, not for the ark itself. He's looking for the actual original word of God because he believes he has cracked the ultimate code of that and that there are important messages within it. And I, I have no doubt he's right. But this is the Torah connected to what? Oh, a cross that says Salomone. Remember, we've got Templo di Salomone. So this is Solomon's Torah. In fact, you could make it even simpler by just making it a straight up line. It contains all the words, the letters rather, of the word Solomon. But I'm going to keep it as Solomon's because it's King Solomon. Remember, there's the king connected to that King Solomon's Torah. That would be the original, wouldn't it? The King Solomon's Torah would be the one that was written by God, put in the ark, brought through the desert, landed in the tabernacle in the city of David, where they built <laughs> the original Solomon's temple south of the Fort Antonia. In fact, it would be the ancient Solomon's Torah. Now, why is this significant? I mean, why? It is a straight, straight line right down the middle and crossing it, letters that all put together with two letters duplicated, Apocrypha. And here, we're, here we get to, wow, the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are the so-called non-canonical writings, seven books that are included in some Bibles and not in other Bibles. Who wants them in? The Catholics. The Catholics want them in because they still, they believe them canonical and they said so in something that they you know, they, we've all heard of these councils that they, that they uh, convened to decide who's right and who's wrong and what can be acceptable in religion. And one of them was called the Council of Trent, in which it was decided conclusively that the Catholics wanted to head off this, 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 this whole Protestant movement that was brewing during John Dee's time, during literally the, uh, the mid to early 1500s, and then on the continent with the Rosicrucians and Luther and the other movements that were coming into being there who were saying they did not believe that the Apocrypha were real and should be included, those seven books. Well, they're the juicy bits, frankly. They're the parts that are, are, um, <laughs> are confirmed by the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they're all about blood lineages and, and this sort of thing. But so some, the Protestants don't want them in the Bible. That's the bottom line. And the Catholics held a convening in Trent, which is right here, Trent. And they were the fathers of the church, Padre, but they were plural, so we can add this other cross into the cross there. Padres is the uh, Spanish plural and Padre is the Italian plural. I think I might have got that the other wrong way around. One of them's Spanish and one's Italian, and they were mainly the one. I mean, they were, they were from all over Europe, coming together for eighteen years, having this 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 convocation of decision making, known as the Council of Trent, in which they decided that the Apocrypha must be included, and there they are. The original Torah and the Apocrypha of Solomon, the sorry, the Torah of Solomon and the original Apocrypha, seven books that are not normally included in Protestant Bibles. Well, isn't the King James Bible supposed to be a Protestant Bible? Yes, it is. Well, yeah, this is the new Bible. This is for, uh, we're in the Protestant world now, and yet they made sure they absolutely insisted on including the Apocrypha, which went against Protestant ideals. So where's that at? King James Bible contains the Apocrypha, and technically speaking, it shouldn't. Still has a cross here saying, hidden in a church. <laughs> What's hidden in a church? The Mercy Seat, King Solomon's ancient Torah, that would be the original Hebrew text, the Apocrypha, associated with the Trent Council. Wow. But to me, the most amazing part is that 
What is that about Rossio Madonna, the Ark, the Tabot? It's a mystery. There are more questions than answers being made here, but this is revolutionary, groundbreaking information. It is about Shakespeare writing the the very engravings along with John Dee, who helped obviously to cryptographize it, if that's a word, and Francis Bacon. Together they all put it together. And that alone would be a big story if it were not also telling us, wow, we need to tell you about the Ark. There's a couple of them. Maybe there's more of them. Maybe they're all connected. What are they? Are they a device? Are they... I mean, the Bible speaks of this being an unimaginably powerful instrument. I don't know. I'm going to show you the conclusion of this in Bardco Bardcast 15. <laughs> Literally, you've got Old Testament, New Testament, and Old and New combined, just put together in three different grids, the middle one being 24 squared, the perfect perfect number in many, many ways and very significant mathematically. So, join me in two weeks' time, unless one of you sends me something that sends me down another rabbit hole, in which case I might have to take a month off. <laughs> Please keep them coming. I mean it sincerely. I want your help. I want your involvement. This is too much, too much. I mean, we can all be involved in this. You can help. You are helping. And I deeply appreciate it. Still, if you believe in prayer, pray for those souls. And pray for those who are left, who are in agony now, of course, in Ethiopia. And let's all meditate on bringing the power of truth to bear on this. We must have been given this for a reason. You don't do this kind of work for... It, it, it's a mammoth undertaking, but of course it's, you don't encipher something like this unless it's meant to be found. And now it's been found. It's up to us now to do something with it and find out what is this about? Let's put our intellects and our hearts together and, and, and try to see what the next step is. Thank you for tuning in and barding out. I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time.